We wish to advise that tonight's edition of Roy and HG may include material that could offend some viewers. Tabby, thanks very much, brand new Beatles. Thanks very much, Nissan Cedrix. Hello, Australasian jigglers and jogglers. Welcome to Club Buggery on another Sunday night when too much variety will be barely enough. Tonight, Club Buggery coming to you from the Torch the Wick room here in Rockhampton, Queensland. And a Torch the Wick on another week of danger and romance here on Club Buggery. Let's simply ask Graham Paging Roy Slavin, which issue have you ripped from the tissues this week? Sport. Yes, she, she it's been a marvellous week for Tasmania, yes. hasn't it? Oh. It's, not often we, it's not often the Apple Isle is utmost in our minds. No, it's just true. But I think it is at the moment. It's really been a run of inns, <laughs> I think, for Tasmania. We, we've had Ricky Ponting selected in the Australian oh. cricket team. We've got the Targa oh, Tour. Targa. I love those Targa cars. Yeah. They're yeah. so exciting. Yeah. They are up the hill and down. Oh, they're yeah. really... Slide around them. They're really... Quick, oh, yes. aren't they? Yeah. And faster, it seems, in Tasmania than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. We've got Brian Harradine, of course, having the balance of power in the Senate. Yes, at Ironically, last. at a time when uh, people can get up to whatever they like in the privacy of their own bedrooms in Tasmania. At last. At last. Mm. But the big news for mine, HG, is the discovery, it seems, may be a hint of a sniff of a Tasmanian tiger in Irian Jaya. Uh, <laughs> tremendous news. <laughs> tremendous news. Yes. I'd love to see a tiger back in a cage in Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> they were so much fun to bang off. <laughs> you know, they had all that fun in the 20s and 30s, just putting bloody bullets in them, because that was so bloody slow and stupid. They're, thylacine, I think they're called. Yes, that's right. Wouldn't it be lovely to have a bloody one in a cage you can uh, go and have a fiddle with in Tasmania once? <laughs> I'd love it. How did it get to Irian Jaya, Roy? <laughs> Got me jiggered. To I think it's agent. more of a case of how did they get from Erie and Jaya to Tasmania in the first place. <laughs> oh. I, 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 think, uh, I think there was la a land breed. <laughs> right, right. The land breed. Right. This was not long after I think we were part of Gondwana in South America. Right. We're all fused together because they have similar things to thylacines, I think, in South America. Right. Not the same silly stripes that we had in Tasmania. Right. But uh, that's the way the world used to be. Yeah. It's a funny old world, isn't it? Weird. <laughs> and that is why I'm setting the scene here in the Torch of the Week. It's now time to welcome a man who has recently down the rugby league tool mm. to pick up an Olympic blunt instrument. Uh, Nissan Cedric, can you bludge on the blind side for a while? And while you're lurking out there, can you join Tina Turner, Simply the Best, and the Quit for Life Rugby League? League trophy together and when you've got that all in the bag can you go head high on the John Quayle story I died inside the day that football cried I cried inside the day that football died Oh John what went wrong the greatest game of all is not the same it doesn't belong 
a tale how the evil forces of darkness came to prevail. Thanks for coming in, John. Now, a lot of people forget that you played rugby league, but we've unearthed a performance, a magnificent performance by your good self in the 1972 grand final. You're number nine. As you run on here, you're probably the last on there. I think it's uh, East v Manly. You go in early there. You knock a, knock a Manly player over. You get ready. You're hungry. You're looking for work. And there you find more work. There away you go there. And then, of course, uh, there's a chance here uh, to stack on something. I think you decide to go into dummy, dummy half here. What are you doing there? And so many options. So many options. Bring the ball our way. That's right, John. And away it comes there. And here you are, making a, a burst. A bloody big hole opens up. East go forward. Outside. That's your try. That's your try, John. Magnificent work. Now... Obviously, uh, you've swapped codes, so to speak, and left the rugby league and have, are now working with the Olympics. How would you compare organising the rugby league to organising the Olympics? Well, I guess uh, the Olympics, I'm part of a, a big team because it is a massive exercise, but it's one that I, I think uh, we're going to make sure that not only Sydney, but certainly Australia are going to be very proud of. And I think that the exciting thing about the Olympics is it is the biggest event in the world and it's here. And I think uh, as a former sporting administrator, to be part of that team, that's something that's going to be great. You see, the only comparison I would make, though, is that when you were with the rugby league, you were sort of like the godfather or one of the godfathers along with Ken. Uh, well, now that you're working for the uh, Olympic movement, which I do feel is uh, the international Olympic movement has very many similarities to the mafia, uh, I do feel as though now you've come down a peg or two. Uh, in the in the uh, pecking order. I'm not quite sure of my mafia structure to put slot you in, so to speak, into the mafia hierarchy, but it does have elements of that, doesn't well, it? They've, the they've fitted me in. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> they've fitted me yes. in. I, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've got a good group, so uh, whether we're going to be called the mafia or not, I don't know, but I'm down the ladder a little bit, so which is pretty good. I'm, I'm, that's one part of it I'm enjoying. Right, right. Yes, would you like an hour in a room with a baseball bat with Ken Cowley? <laughs> Two hours yeah. in a room with a baseball bat with Johnny Rebo? It wouldn't take that long. <laughs> That's, that's all, uh, that's in the past for me. I, I know think, it is, uh, yeah. I know it is, but we should just draw the past just for a moment, John, because <laughs> it seems to me you ruined rugby league. <laughs> you were responsible, you can bucketed I, it up. Can now, I, can, can, can I, I just tell you say why, to you, I, you, were, you were never heard of until rugby league, so don't you start. <laughs> yes, John. You used to... Hang on, hang on, hang on. You hang on. used to come into Let those grounds. Let me finish grounds. the thesis. You used to... <laughs> no. You used to sneak in, you used to pose as a cleaner. Is this... You used to pose as a security guard, you used we... to run off the game, and that's why we all love you, because we... of rugby league. Sure, we sniffed around Phillip Street because there was plenty of ooze coming out of Phillip Street <laughs> to sniff, John, to be fair. Now, you ruined rugby league because you made it too successful. You made it interesting to the most, uh, to the wealthiest media magnet in the world. That was your mistake, wasn't it? Well, it's a compliment in one way. I think that uh, a lot of people had worked very hard to make it great, and I think it was accepted around the nation that way. But again, uh, you know, when you have the big players, and we had pay television arriving in Australia, and that's what it was all about. It was never about football. It was about pay television and uh, owning a great, uh, a great sporting uh, organisation, and uh, that's what happened. John, in 1972, there was a big interest in rugby league, i.e. meaning people would go to the game and watch rugby league. By the time you left it, we had the sort of half-time entertainment we'll see now, taken from a couple of grand finals. Here you are, choreographing Tina Turner, uh, a magnificent advocate for rugby league, knew all about it, had the Wixen Whitmar look about her. And uh, then, of course, out of the crowd, leaps up a rugby league supporter with a big horn out front, doing some marvellous work. And if we can get a top shop here, look at the horn oh, work! Oh, yes!
that is league. Is it any wonder everybody got on board the league train? And then, of course, I think if this finishes up as it will in a minute, we move to 1995 and we see one of the finest halftime promotions for television here. Have a look at this. This will bring back memories. An exploding television set that almost kills a couple of hundred people. <laughs> we, we were lucky enough not to have, not to make the front page. Now, look. I raise this because I know that your venues manager, you won't be allowing any of the venues to have that sort of gear at half time in the Olympics, will you? Not at all. No, no good. Not at all. Good. Wasn't It'll she good? Wasn't it good to see her there again? Magnificent. Brought back so many memories. And as Roy keeps pointing out, people now think rugby league more often than they think sex. Thanks very much to Tina Turner and simply the best. But to develop a thesis, if I could borrow a word from Roy, is that recently there's been some chat that Australian people, especially in New South Wales, aren't that interested in the Olympics and that we have to rekindle the spark around the state to get people interested and that the ideas come from SOCOG that we tour the Olympic flag. Now, what to tawdry? I hope there's no hint that you've had anything to do with this, John. This is very weak. I'll give you an idea of what they're going to look at. Here, this is what they're going to see. They're going to see something that looks like this coming into their town. This is the actual flag, John, that's going around. Is this going to inspire the nation to get behind the Olympic Games? I put it to you, John Quayle. We are selling the Olympics the dump. We are selling this nation the dump. If this is the best we can deliver by way of a promotion for the Olympics in the year 2000. Am I being too harsh, John Cole? I don't think I am. Now, the IOC, you the have, IOC... You, you've forgotten to tell everyone you're going with the flag. Yes, I'm going, because I'm offering to march nude around Australia with the flag. To come into Wagga and Broken Hill, nude with the flag trailing out behind me. Getting people interested, giving kiddies memories, John. <laughs> now look. Won't it be good? The thing about oh, it'll be great. Well, why hasn't it got the stain on it that the original's got? <laughs> well, that that's a mystery, and is it? That's still a mystery. Do you know how the you know how the stain got there, don't well, you? Well, <laughs> there's a few people who've tried to hint to me, but what you said in the dressing room to me, yeah. I'm going to take that back, and I think there'll be an investigation. Did Juan Antonio Samaranch and his gastric problems have anything to do with this? <laughs> You told me it was Neil Fraser. <laughs> John, the difficulty is, though, the difficulty is, is that the real flag, the one with the stains on it, is now in a Westpac bank vault accruing bank charges, and no one's ever going to be able to get the bloody thing out again, because no one will have enough money to pay the bank for the storage. No, we'll get it out. It'll be all right. Don't you worry. It's, it's what Sandy Holway said to me today. This is... It's one thing that's never been done before, and you guys ringing up this week, yeah. seeking your tickets again, yes. <laughs> three years out, oh, yes, I don't think it was very good. No. But I tell you what, yeah. they have allowed, because as venue manager, mm. you're not going to be able to sneak in like you used to. No. So there's your official tie. Oh, thanks Ooh. very much, John. This is magnificent so of you. your accreditation yeah. as members of the media yeah. is being checked out. That's a bit of a worry. Will this tie get us in? No. No. And why is Roy's different to mine, John? Sorry? Why is Roy's different to mine? Because that... we wanted to identify you. Oh, right. 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 It's a terrific design, isn't it? It's a fabulous design. Look, I, I was reading uh, some of the thoughts of Ken Arthurson this morning, John. Uh, he said something to the effect that it helps in administration if you've, uh, if you've laced up a boot. Uh, is this true? Do you find having played rugby league it was easier to administer rugby league? Well, I don't think it was easy to administer it. Yeah. I think it was easier to acknowledge what, how great it was. Yeah. I think that the easy part of any sport was playing it and participating sure. in it. And I think when you go on to that next step of administrating, yeah. it, uh, you never think about that when you're playing. But I, I think it's helped. It's still a team thing, though, isn't it, administration? It's, it's to do with a team. There's, it must be the same at SOCOG. You're a team there. Do you feel it's part of, you're part of a team? We are a great team, and that's yeah. why I think that it's very important that now the people, not only of Sydney, but Australia, yeah. get behind that team. Sure. Because we do have a big job, yeah. and we need everyone supporting us. Because. Uh, but Michael Knight's not a team player. Yes, he is. He's not a team player. He just... Yes, he how is. many people's he sacked? <laughs> <laughs> What's 
we'll make it easy for work. you. You put your hand up. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. No, 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 not since I've been there. He's been yeah. OK. He's all right at the moment. Is your position safe? I well, mean, do you, do you shadow when Michael Knight job. comes around? You well, think, oh, bloody hell, I'm next. As they, as, there's a pretty famous saying within SACOG, don't iron too many shirts. Because you might need them for the five days. Yeah, but, um, no, we're all right. It must be a happy team then, John. No. <laughs> There's one good thing about it, it is, and uh, you've got a committed group of people there, and uh, from now right through, that's the, the, the funny part about it, we're not delivering and they get because 99% of everything is planning right up until the uh, delivering the 60 days, but it's going to be great, and as I said, there's a great team there, and uh, yeah. I think we'll prove uh, th These tickets that are going like hotcakes for the opening ceremony and the closing ceremony, the $10,000 tickets, why are they so cheap? <laughs> Well, if can we have a couple? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got the ties. I don't think we well, need them. Well, you've got. Uh, well, the ones you applied for this week were the synchronised swimming. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's been organised. Yes. Oh, so we can get in. You could get into you'd that be one. Beauty. That's fine. And, <laughs> and uh, you've got your spots on the marathons, so everything's fine. Can we just return to rugby league for a minute? The, uh, <clears throat> the breakaway competition recently staged a match which, uh, you know, featured players from New South Wales and uh, players from Queensland. And don't tell me you didn't have a grin on your face when you saw the result. <laughs> uh, did they play? Yeah, oh, don't pretend, John Pyle. It was a magnificent display by people who have been born and bred uh, in New South Wales playing rugby league. Sure, they might have changed the rules, but still basically rugby league. Clobbering maroons. I now, don't this, tell me they didn't state of a origin history. happens in May, doesn't oh, it? It's, right, it's oh, on it's next it. month as far. Oh. The ARL's the real thing. No, no, I accept that. But, you know, you, you obviously you would have enjoyed the performance of blue players. I, I didn't see it. Oh, you read the papers, though. No, I didn't. No, oh. someone told me about right. it. So did you have a grin when did somebody you, told did you? Did you cover it? We you covered didn't cover it. We covered it in our minds. From the television. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like the new faster rules, John? Do you like it faster? <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to one. answer that one if you don't want to. Very good one. Are refereeing standards as high as they've ever been? They're the same. <laughs> They're <laughs> hopeless, aren't they? Bloody hopeless. When... Nothing's changed. <laughs> a historical question. When Ken rang up and said nine are going... What's happened to Arca? You're calling Ken now? Yeah, only because you're here. Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, because when we use the other names, often people scratch their heads and wonder who we're talking about. Uh, when Ken rang up and said nine are going with uh, Super League on Monday night, when Arco rang up, rather, so as you'll understand, uh, nine are going with Super League on Monday night, what did you say apart from poo? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't think we should say that tonight. <laughs> no, I understand. Is it fair to say, uh, John, that uh, you, if you've got enough money, you can buy whatever law you like? Is that the lesson to be learned? Well, after what we went through, it's pretty hard to uh, accept that uh, the court says you can do everything that's supposedly wrong and uh, against the law, but you can win. Now, uh, I think that's very hard, and I think a lot of uh, league people and a lot of Australians uh, yeah. find that hard to uh, accept, but that's the decision of the law. We have to accept it. You've got no option. How did Kerry take it? Was Kerry over the moon? <laughs> well, I think he was overseas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In Louisiana, right? <laughs> Well, look, John, it's tremendous to have you on the show at last. Uh, look, uh, you know, obviously Roy and I have ha in enjoyed yours and Arco's work in the office there at Phillips Street over the years uh, with enormous pleasure. And uh, it's just a marvellous to uh, renew old acquaintance here and bury the league so uh, hatchet, so to speak, and look forward to more stupidity on the Olympic front. <laughs> and on that cheerful note, it's time to wish John all the very best in the Olympic caper. And I ask everyone whether here in the wick or there at home to get him out and start wanging away to thank John Quayle.
show that's a very warm favourite for the Logie. Coming up on May the 18th in the highly competitive space drama under 13 minutes. It's a hotly contested field this year. Let's once again climb the stepladder, take a peek at the 29th century and cross over to the flight deck of the BG for another stanza in Star Search. <laughs> Life on board the BG goes on, with sex inevitably raising its belial head. Sex and time. As John Rawls once said, if I only had time, only time. I overheard you having loud sex with grade two rude dog rooter. I did. We did. We did it. And? And we might do it again. Oh, don't you realise it's against the Ajax O'Leary Code of Conduct? And who might tell him? Puffy butt? Oh, well, darling, you can play the smeared horn with whoever you like, as long as it doesn't compromise the mission of this ship. I'll bear that in mind. Crew, to laboratory immediately for a missive from the master. I think we're needed. Well, I don't know about you, darling, but I think I'll be needed. And this late 20th century genius, Ralph Sarich, had great success with his time machine. On trips, he sent many important people. Uh, Great Norman, uh, a car salesman, Alan Jones, a talking parrot, and Tony Lockett, a sportsman, who took a great number of canines on a trip to find out how the pyramids were built. Canines? Hmm. You mean dogs, don't you, Master? Quite so, Dogwood. Thought so. Interesting. Hmm. Anyway, on the day of the official launch of the time machine, 9th of March, 1999, Johnny Farnham had the Sarich time bracelets attached to each limb, and he was programmed to attend a major sporting event in 2000. But, owing to mobile phone electromagnetic interference, only his leg made a trip to nobody knew where. Well, now, we have that leg. Amazing. If you're right, Master, there should be a Sarich time bracelet on this leg. And here it is. Do you know what this means? We can travel in time, Master. Exactly. If I can get this thing working, I can amplify its power and we can all travel to whatever time we like. I'm sure of it. This is great. Real entertainment at last. Get to it, crew. So it may happen. With the time machine, I'll have the chance to show them all how I became a master of mirth the most decorated commander of my time. I'll blow them away. Here's a little number that means a lot to me. It goes something like this. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Football this week is the fusing of two great Australian traditions, and that is Rugby League and the Anzac Day, uh, with the Anzac Day Test, now supported fully by the RSL, uh, featuring two sides, one from Australia and one from New Zealand, uh, hence the Anzac Bridge. Now, uh, I think the uh, RSL were paid $20,000 for this uh, sort of naming rights, uh, you know, idea of sponsorship of sorts uh, in the Anzac Day, um, in the Anzac Day festivities. Uh, this had produced a loud of frenzy from feral journalists and talkback radio announcers across the nation. Roy, can it work and is it a good idea? Uh, AC, I think it's one of the most exciting ideas uh, ever since, uh, say, football and sex were fused by John Quayle uh, <laughs> just a few years ago. Uh, Anzac and Rugby League, yes. it's got a real ring to it. Uh, I, I phoned uh, Laurie Daly, the Australian captain, captain. once uh, I found out about it. He was very excited about it. I asked him to name, say, five Australian Anzac heroes. Uh, he couldn't. Uh, He'd never heard of, say, Sir Roden Coupler. Oh, yes. He'd never heard of Weary Dunlop. Oh, no, Weary. Uh, he'd never heard of, uh, say, uh, John Gordon, who yeah. I think was shot down. Uh, uh, he'd never heard of, say, Keith Miller. Uh, had he heard uh, of Simpson and the Donkey? He hadn't heard of Simpson and the Donkey. No, oh, gee. So, so I think if if each of the players uh, can learn about Anzac, can become ambassadors <coughs> for Anzac, yeah. and go around to the schools, mm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Captain Laurie Daly, Captain, mm. 
in military uniform, right. representing the rugby league uh -huh. and Anzac, right. and go in and tell the kiddies the story of Anzac. Right. He can relive for them in their minds, say, Posse Ears. Yeah, and the song. The song, Ypres. Yeah. Oh, tricky. Very, yeah, very, 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 very tricky. No one knew what was going on. No one knew what years. was going on. Yeah. He, he can describe what a loon, say, General Haig was. Oh, yeah. What, what, yeah. A, what, 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 what a loon. The, the difficulty is in the Kokoda Trail. Oh, yeah. You know, Alan Langer could describe the Kokoda. I'll pass you over to my, my, or my, my deputy, uh, Private Alan Langer, <laughs> to describe the Kokoda Trail. <laughs> oh, it was real bad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, jeez, they had a bad time. We were saved by the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. The Fuzzy Wuzzy... Have you heard, kids, about the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels? Oh, we were buggered. We, mm. you know, it was, re it was real bad because it was muddy and wet and cold and weird and people were shooting at us and, oh, jeez, it was bad. Uh, I think it could work because oh, yeah. it's going to get kiddies thinking, Anzac. What is that? Yes. Uh. Yeah. Count me in. Yeah. Where can I sign up? Where can I sign up? Look, I don't think it went far enough, though, Roy, because mm. I'd like to see the first test, say, played on the Somme, mm. uh, the second test played at Gallipoli, and imagine, you know, 50 or 60,000 Australian and New Zealanders cramming into the Gallipoli beachhead to mm. see the lads run up and down. Mm -hmm. And then the, th the third one, say, played on the Kokoda Trail, uh, halfway along. You no, know, on that, an angle like that. Yeah, on an angle like that. <laughs> I think you'd run downhill in the second half, but uh, I'm not an expert about rugby league. But the other thing that I find difficult with the idea, having said that all those things are good, is that I understood in the Second World War the enemy were the, well, at least in the Second and First World War, the enemy were the Germans, the Japs and the Turks. Johnny, now, when, Johnny Turk. Johnny Turk. Now, when I last look at the rugby league atlas of the world, I didn't see a flag in each of those countries. No. And I'm just wondering if the promoters, i.e. Super League, could get behind this and get a team out of Japan, because let's not forget we're technically still at war at, with them, because we, they never said they were sorry. They could get a bloody side up from Japan, a side up from Turkey, and a side up, say, even a you know, scratch side from Italy, because uh, they were there in the Second World War. Or a sort of tri-series. A tri-series. <laughs> yeah. Of the triple entente. And the best would play Australia. And you'd have the triple, the triple alliance, yeah. the, our lot. Yeah, that's right. Now, that's got an idea to it. But so far, it's, it's, we're playing our mates. I mean, sure, we hate New Zealand. We always want to beat them, especially in soccer with the yeah. World Cup coming up. But bloody hell, Roy, it just because doesn't ring right. It confuse kids. I know. Because they're going to think know. Anzac, Australia, New Zealand, and America. Yeah. Army cool. Yeah. Australia, well, New not, Zealand. Well, that's not right. That's not right. We yeah. should be, we should be, you know, should be with New Zealand. Yeah. Somehow doing something doing with them. Doing something with them. Not to them. Not to them. Yeah. No. Roy, the other thing, though, that where I'd like the idea, where I think the idea's got enormous potential is, as the ranks of the diggers thin out, I'd love to see the ranks swirl with rugby league players who have played in these test matches against New Zealand on Anzac. Day. Yeah. And yeah. don't tell me that Laurie will probably, Laurie Daly, I mean, I don't want to put the mock on him, but he'll probably have a few kids later on in life. He will. And then when Laurie gets to be, say, 90, they the can kids march. can march yeah. along. Yeah. And so you'd have a terrific synthesis of you the great would. things that have held this nation together, yeah. i.e. war and rugby league. You would. And uh, you would. as the... So you'd, ha you'd have to say that if there are a few remaining from the 38th from the Kokoda Trial yeah. or the 43rd... Yeah, the, the second, that... seventh field Ambulance. Yeah, or well, the ones that uh, General Blamey tried to bugger up. Yeah. Few of them marching because there wouldn't be many left. Yeah. Behind them, you'd have, ladies and gentlemen, the Canterbury Bankstown Rugby League Club. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or the Australian representative from the Canterbury Bankstown Rugby, Rugby League, League Club. Club. Yeah. yeah. And all the kiddies. Uh. Well, I think it's got future to it. Uh. I'd like to see trenches around, say, if you're going to have it at the Sydney Football Stadium, yeah. big trench and barbed wire around there. Yeah. 25 pounders up there. 25 pounders. Blasting off, blasting you know. off. Yeah, and, and, and people might be able to buy clods and things and stones and rocks. Uh. And when a player's injured, you get Simpson and his donkey to go out and get them. <laughs> yeah, and you can hurl rocks at them. Yeah. Oh, look. Oh, I know where you're going for. Put him over and drag him off yeah. under fire getting it. That's right. That's right. Well, the other thing is, is that any player went down to be in order for a DSO, oh, a yeah. distinguished service order. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that if people were died eventually, yeah. as something will go stupidly wrong in rugby yeah. league, uh, a VC. VC. Posthumously. Posthumously. Yeah. yeah. And a yeah. man of the match series might get a VC, say, or the man of the series yeah. might get a VC yeah. uh, every so often when it was, a, you know, a terrific match. Yeah. Don't tell me the old diggers. Not that there's all that many left of the original Anzacs. Yeah, there might yeah. be only half a dozen. Yeah. But they'd love to see a Australia play a Turkish team. Oh. In fact, <laughs> we bloody will murder them. Uh, <laughs> they'd be hopeless. Oh, no. <laughs> Wouldn't they? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, they'd be a joke. Yeah. It'd be like 100 nil. Yeah. Well, easily. <laughs> Right. In the first half. Yeah, and then, then we'd run down the hill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, oh I'd love so to many see possibilities. That. I'd love there. to see an Indonesian team. I don't know what their position was. Uh. Where did Indonesia stand? Uh. I don't know. No. I'd like to see an Indonesian team. Yeah. I'd like to see a Korean team. Yeah. I'd like to see Japan v Korea. Oh, that'd be a beauty. I'd like to see East Timor v Indonesia. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a bit of a grudge. I know who we'd be rooting for. Yeah. Not your correct luck, Tommy. No. I don't. No. What is he taking out from that, Tom? Oh, well, I assume so. I assume you'll get the nod in the end if the old sister doesn't get in the road and uh, buy the rugby league. Uh, and now, Club Bugger, it's a tremendous thrill to be able to introduce to you a duo who are with us week in, week out mm. in the toughest variety competition in the world. And every time I see them in action, I, 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 I'm just reduced to little pieces of painful rubble. Uh, they're that good. The tune this evening is the Love Symbols Gusset Grabber Strolling. Uh, the backing the brand new Beatles, Australia, can you welcome to the Torch the Wicker here in the Bugger House, the duo who have always been with us, in other words, Club Buggery's very own Nissan Cedrics! <laughs> Cedric's and that was the pluggers back and still pulling them in arrangement of scrolling and uh, the Beatles on the tweak and the tear and the Nissan Cedric's blowing your mind. You, look, it's not a it's not a term I often use when uh, critiquing a performance, but I, th I think on this occasion it was entirely justified. Now, in the wake 
Uh, of his enormous success last weekend at the US Masters, Greg Norman has had some golfing hints published in uh, Golf Australia, the world credentialed uh, local golfing magazine. Isn't that a great magazine? It's a very good read. For those who are wanting to improve their game, I suggest they go to the news agent tomorrow morning and buy the Sunday papers on Golf Australia. Now, having got well, you can read it right? in the news part. Yeah, Just that's right. It. Certainly the tips don't Put it take back on the rack, yeah. The tip <laughs> concerning putting for Greg Norman is one that he practices the putting with his eyes shut. Yes, it's hard to imagine that Greg does this while he's putting. This explains an awful lot about why he dudded out last weekend at uh, Augusta, because he took what he did in the training paddock into the match itself. Mm. Roy, can it work? You've given it a go this week. How are you getting on with it? Yes, I did, HG. I've got a couple of balls here. Yes. A couple of terrific balls. They're sort of leaden balls, yes. as you can see. Plutonium. Uh, plutonium balls for safety in the studio. Look, uh, and I do have a club here, exactly the one the shark used. HG, if we imagine this to be our hole... Well, I'll mark it with a flag, Roy. If, uh, uh, we've got our hole there. And yes. Let's say we've got a... Let's say a tricky lie at Augusta. Uh, let's say somewhere around here. Yes. Now, set the scene for us, Roy. That's you've got Easterhoose, you've got Woosnam, you've got Fowler, you've got Price, you've got Ernie Els, all one stroke behind you. You've got to sink this to get the green jack. That's right. And Bob Tway. Bob Tway, oh, yeah, bloody Bob Tway. <laughs> Kalkovic here. Uh, Kalkovic. Did you mention him? Well. Yeah. What about Ian Woos's Woosnam? I mentioned him. Did you? Gee, it's a fantastic field. Isn't it ever? Yeah, that's right. What about the Merry Mix? Ah, oh, Lee Trevino. Lee Trevino, Laugh and Lee. And Arnie's Army and the Golden Bear, and they're all one stroke behind you. Yeah, well, Sharky would address the... I oh, know it's a difficult... Sharky would go straight at the bloody cup. Yeah. With the eyes Sharky's shut. a bloody an idiot with the eyes closed. <laughs> so he'd teeter with the eyes closed and have a bang. <laughs> <laughs> Open the eyes and see what happens. <laughs> Shark, you're going to have to get out a bloody, uh, say, a, a three-iron because you're 400 metres down the road. <laughs> Opens his eyes and, oh, you know, phew, something went wrong. The way I, I think you've got to do, I did do a bit of practice during the week, actually, I, I think you've got to assess the lie. Yes, you do, don't with you? With the eyes open. Yeah. Wander around. I would approach it this way. I'd bang off around here. I'd go completely crazy and go this way. Yes, Roy, looking good. Looking very good. Oh! Oh! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, what the shark overlooks is that golf's a simple game for simple people. Just hit the ball and put it in the hole. Just hit the ball and put it in the hole. Yeah. You, but you do have to fuse. I know, what, I know where the shark's coming from. Yeah. Man, I know he's blowing <laughs> his mind. He's trying to fuse the club head with the mind. <laughs> But you can't really do that. No. The cranium gets in the way. <laughs> you could have true. trepaining style a bit cut out yeah. and actually stick the club head right in. Yeah. That'd fuse it somehow. Yeah. But basically, I think you've got, to, you've got to use a bit of common sense and your senses. Open your eyes to yeah. putt. Yeah. That seems to be the lesson. Yes. And now it's time to welcome to the bug house a man who has thrilled us for 20 years or so as uh, not only Norman Gunston, but the son out of Mother and Son. Uh, he, look, he needs absolutely no introduction to Australian television audiences, so he's not getting one. Nissan Cedric, can you have an extra close shave and stick cotton woolly bits on the cuts? Uh, can you bury rip snorters while you're sore in Fallen Angels and give us the long handle of the Gary MacDonald story? <laughs> Yes, uh, thanks for coming in, Gary. It's entirely safe. Uh, look, uh, <laughs> the wrong colour. We, uh, you've recently uh, been involved in two television productions in Australian TV, one of which is still with us. And let's have a look at an upcoming episode from Fallen Angels on the ABCs on Friday nights. 
Fallen Angels. This is a terrific scene, yeah, Gary. Uh, if we can get the I sound up. Probably it's very trebly, the sound on this. I don't know who was your yeah. sound recordist in this inch, but it's very trebly and we get every lip, smack. every lip smack. It's a lovely scene. It's a very moving scene. I'd love to watch it with you at home, talking all the way through. Yes. Well, we should. Well, we let the pictures speak for themselves, I suppose, Gary. It's, uh... oh my God. it's a beautiful scene. Yeah, why not? On my desk. Nobody's watching. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if it's a Labour Party tradition. Well, you talked over the feed. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, it's a terrible. It's a tremendous scene. scene. Tremendous scene. Do you like it in your trousers? Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me to stand up right now after watching no. that. No. <laughs> That was interesting that scene doing that that was the um, that was the um, most interesting one to do with with um, with my lover and that do you get aroused when you're doing a scene like that do you, uh... i think that was what i was trying to sort of get round, no, you looked around aroused. I, was, you looked around. I was aroused you're right to get aroused but do you really get aroused do you have to say oh no hold it i'll have to break for a few minutes <laughs> There was no problems with Esther Maritzeki. I mean, to tell you, I don't know whether she got aroused, but I certainly did. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, look, can we talk about the one that's not on television briefly? Uh, where were you when you found out the news that Seven weren't going to give it a go? I mean, I loved it. I think everybody loved it. But the only people in Australia who didn't like it were the Seven executives. I mean, if they'd let it run, I mean, as somebody pointed out to me this, the, only this week, they gave Wheel seven years before they realised it at rate. Seven years. They gave Rip Snorter about seven episodes. Not even that. Uh, 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 well, Roy, before the show, said to me, you've done a bit of everything, have you? except you haven't done a game show. Yeah. So what do you think Rip Snorter's yeah. was? Oh, yeah. Roy doesn't watch television. No, no, no. No. He only watches clips like that and blueies. Uh, Gary, Wait, no, my son calls it Gary McDonald's R.I.P. Snorters. Uh, right. Oh. Right. Um, yeah, I was in Catherine. Actually, I was fishing in Catherine Gorge. Yeah. I was just about to go fishing in Catherine Gorge and I got the news. And it's snorters at the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think it was the band tuning up. It sounded more like... It sounded more like flatulence to me. Oh, wow. Thank heavens nothing like that happened in that scene with Esther Maritzetti. Yeah. That was really cool. <laughs> Audiences get very relaxed in this program. <laughs> Very relaxed. People can do what they like. Thank heavens they're going to They want to blow it. off, they just... Yeah, well, well, well. <laughs> yeah, I think it was mentioning Rip Snorters has that effect. <laughs> That's right, man. Yeah. Sorry, you were at Catherine and somebody rang up and Well, said... yeah, yeah, and said... Uh, they actually said to me, um, Gary, they're not going to go ahead with Rip Snorters. Now, I said, oh. Uh, uh, they said, now, you, are, you do have one more to shoot, uh, but... You don't have to shoot it if you don't want to. They don't uh, mind. If you don't want to, have to shoot it, you don't have to shoot it. That was kind of them. Yeah, I said, okay, I won't yeah, shoot it. Won't shoot it. Um, <laughs> so they've got about six, I think, up their sleeves. Now... They'll be haunting me for years, I know. They just sneak one out every now and then, you know. Yes, can I just uh, pursue the fishing thing for a while? Yep. I mean, how... I know you did to relax and to uh, sort of get your mind off, uh, you know, obviously the problems of rip snorters and television <laughs> and so on, but how does killing things help that? <laughs> Killing things, <laughs> killing defenceless fish help that. Oh, I thought you meant like killing TV series. Oh, um, no, no, no. Just, just... I put them back most of the time. Oh, I yeah. kill the odd one. The other day my wife said, look, I want, I want to take a couple of these because she's a new, new convert to fishing, mm. you see. I absolutely adore fishing. And she, she's, she just started a couple of weeks ago. I took her to New Zealand fly fishing. The first day she caught five fish and the second day she caught three, one of which was six and a half pounds, the other one was six pounds. So she's, uh, you know, she's pretty bloody on the, good. On the money. So she said, she said, now look, I want to keep on some of these fish. I want, you know, I want a meal tonight. So I said, oh, well, all right. And she caught this nice fish and I said, well, you want to keep this one? You know, she said, yes, yes, I want to keep it. I said, okay, okay. So I killed it. She said, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing that for? Oh, oh yeah. What did you well, do? Was it, a, <laughs> was it a blade through the back of the neck? No, no, no I, I showed it an episode of Rip Snorter and it just... <laughs> <laughs> It is strange, this thing, isn't it, that people don't realise that uh, for a lot of things that we eat, you have to kill them. I've always yeah, enjoyed that yeah, part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, know, there's, there's a, you won't find me backing away from, a, you know, uh, getting a couple of barra and banging their heads together. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, yeah. with just a bit of a ball pain hammer. Uh, look, <laughs> it is what true. I was doing up here. Yeah. Probably there's a... I smack him against a rock. <laughs> that's the way, that's the way. Look, a lot of people, uh, you know, sporting people and media people and identities relax fishing.
Yeah. Uh, it seems to be an incredibly popular sport with, with this. Have you any idea why? Is it something to do with that there's a quarry out there, you've got to concentrate, you've got to think, you've got to forget all the problems of, you know, Channel yeah, 7 and, and there's the no ABC. Ratings. You keep yeah. on bringing up to Channel 7. I'm not oh, too I'm disturbed by it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> maybe I will when I go home after this show. <laughs> but, um, no, I suppose it is because there's the challenge and there's no like there is there, there are no ratings and etc etc but it's it, it's also the surroundings i mean it's fantastic you go somewhere like catherine gorge i mean fishing at catherine gorge mm. up there up the, up the top of uh, gorge one um with the moon coming up behind you and the sun going down the other oh just stunning you know well you fish at night well as, night as you know you know dusk, dusk that's dusk, one of the dusk. best oh, imagine that yeah, Whether on the, so you know, you know about these things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You wanted to be an architect, I read. Is this true? Did you want to be an architect? Oh, Did you well, really want to be an architect? Yeah, until I started doing tech drawing, and then it was as boring as you know dirt. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for a while there, I did want to be an architect. Until I was about fourteen, then I sort of wanted to be a silly bugger. So. Yeah. And and I wanted to be like Peter Sellers. That was you know. Ah, right. And then I wanted to be like Gordon Chater. Right. Now look, you've. Uh, I want to be like Rex Hunt, obviously. Yes. Have you thought? Have you thought about doing a fishing show? Have you had any offers from Seven about the fishing? Show? <laughs> Seven keeps saying no, no. You can't have a fishing show. No, I. Um, no, I, you know, I'm. I'm. I'm just a, a, not all that proficient. I really enjoy it. I love it. But you need some. You need people like Rex Hunt and Steve Starling that really know what they're talking about. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, you, you, uh, you would be like now. giving you guys a, a show on sport, really, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would, yeah, wouldn't it would work. Waste it. Wouldn't work. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, having worked with the ABC and Channel 7, say mm. with uh, the Gunston show, what's the, is there much difference in the culture? Was it easier d working with the ABC than Channel 7, or was it easier with Channel 7? What, what's well, the difference? No, I, I can't answer questions like that. I'll be in trouble. It, and, you know, I won't, might be employed by one of them. Yeah. Well, right. the other. There is a, I guess there's a slight difference. Actually, Channel 7 I've worked with before, and I really enjoy working with them. They're, yeah. they're good people. Yeah. And I love working with the ABC, and it's an incredibly diplomatic answer. Yeah, Certainly beautiful. Is. It was, yeah. <laughs> you can bag nine and ten as much as you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen yeah. loads of nine. Loads nine. I've worked for ten, too. That was fun, yeah. Mm. Now, look, you uh, have a tremendously long history in television, and I think we've got one of your finest moments to have a look at now. It goes back to November 1975. It's all been when, downhill since then, hasn't uh, it? Well, uh, you kept coming back. No, I'm you like, don't did get, I peak too early? No, you don't often get incidents like this in your life and you got a cracker. Let's have a look at it now. On the steps of Parliament House, yeah. oh, yeah. you bump into Bob Hall. Oh, look, it's a bit too serious for that. It certainly is. Oh, no, it certainly is. It's extremely serious. <laughs> in Canberra at the time, or were you wasn't specific? It wasn't yeah. as much fun as the scene with Esther Maritzeki, I must say. No, but, no. Uh, no, I was in a Chinese restaurant at the time, in, in um, um, Mossman or somewhere like that, a Cremorne it was, and uh, I got a phone call there saying, this has just happened. I said, oh, come on, you're joking. So I had to jump on a plane and fly to Canberra and get changed in the, in the restroom yeah. in the toilet, in the plane. I had to yeah. get changed in the toilet and made up and everything. So I sort of, it's a bit like Superman, really. I went in, it's me. <laughs> Came out with the hair all plastered over and the bits of bits yeah. of toilet paper on the face and rushed in there and quickly did it and then went went back to Sydney. Yes. Do you feel those things haunt you a little bit though? Uh, I mean, well, sometimes they do. Yeah, I suppose sometimes they do. I mean, it haunt me. It's wonderful. You know, it, 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 there was a period there a few years back where I I wanted to sort of recreate it and you can't. You yeah. can't really go back. You know, sometimes I think oh, I'd be fun to do that again. It's great fun doing Norman, but. You know, I'm, I did that a long time ago. It's something I've done. So. Is it uh, is it restricting them working, going back and working with a script, uh, say Jeffrey Atherton style? No, 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 no. I, no, I prefer that. You prefer that? You prefer working with a script now? Yeah, than yeah. Can, can't it? you tell from this? <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely no. I, I love working with a script. I love, I love interpreting a script, um, and that's what I was trained to do, really. You know, so um, I guess in a way it was interesting going and doing Mother and Son because when you went from that to say something like um, Fire. I did a couple of episodes of Fire. 
And people are just change the script all the time. And one of the one of the uh, actors said to me, "Oh, you're, you're used to working with really good scripts, you know." Um, but we sort of change stuff all the time. Well, I'm not used to that. Not not in dramas and, and sitcoms. I'm not used mm. to sort of coming in and saying, oh, this is rubbish and mm. putting a blue pencil through stuff. Mm. And finally, you love cooking. How, how did you get started in the cooking cape? And do you yeah, cook you fish? Yeah, I do cook fish. I used, to, I used to love cooking. I mean, I don't mind it now. I used to absolutely adore cooking, but I've got two kids. Well, they're 25 and 22 now. And when my daughter was, was uh, at school, she'd want to know what time the dinner was going to be on the table. And, uh, and if it wasn't, like if I was 15 minutes late, she'd just go off her head. Oh. So I completely lost the, the desire to cook so much. Yeah. Sorry, darling, she's watching the show tonight. Um, so, so I don't cook as much as I used to. It became a bit of a chore after that. It was good fun up until, until then. She, you know, she had the clock on me. So. <laughs> Is, sorry, is there, there going to be another series of Fallen Angels or another series of Mother and Son? No, no, no. Eggshells, no, anything no, like that? No, nothing, nothing like that. No, this looks like a year of fishing for me. The, um, uh, unless they, you know, yeah. decide to resurrect rip snorters after you, you've, given it, you've given it such a big well, build-up. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the world's crying out. More snorters. Thank <laughs> <laughs> <Q. laughs> you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it looks like it might be a year of fishing. Mother and Son finished quite a few years ago, and they're, do they're doing an English version of it now. Um, and uh, there's no, I mean, there's definitely no plans to do any more of that, which is a pity. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And on that rather sad note, despite the <laughs> boost for rip snorters, it's time to wish Gary all the best for a wonderful future in TV. And I ask all Club Bugger reviewers, whether here in the Torch the Wick or there at home, to start wanging the plates of meat to thank Gary McDonald. <laughs> Roy, uh, look, a couple of weeks ago we were able to attend the Elton John 50th birthday bash and we got our holiday snaps back from the Kodak uh, our printer the other day and, uh, by gee, they make attractive viewing. Look, I think it's fair to say that Australian stars were at the forefront of making that night a night to remember. Who did you see and how were they looking? Uh, actually, I, I went... It was a very small group of us, uh, but I think we made an impact. I went with... Uh, uh, Danny Minogue and Molly Meldrum. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it was a very, very special night. Everyone was so happy for Elton. Yeah. Uh, he looked so comfortable. Uh, he didn't want to sit down at all, all night. No. Uh, he was fine. And, uh, and Molly, of course, he had the hat on. All he had was a hat and a sort of plastic sack, yeah. lap-lap style, Flute high. over the mm. sort of seminiferous tubular area, yeah. Yeah. full of a white powder, yeah. which disappeared slowly over the night oh. as people approached him. People he knew that I didn't know approached him with straws. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very fruity night, yeah. a very <laughs> fruity and funny night. And I think he looked best uh, when there was no powder left. It was, it was a look. Yes, that's right. You know, you could see people look at Elton and then catch an eye of uh, Molly and they were looking at Molly, you know. I don't think Elton liked that because I think he likes, you know, you spend $500 million on yourself, you want people to look at you. <laughs> yes, that's true. But I, I think, uh, as you pointed out, Australians were to the forefront and, and, and Molly said to me as we left her tonight, I'll never forget. Did he? Yeah, he did. He did. Why did you uh, say that? Molly, that's one of Molly's. Uh, now in the bug house, it's time for a feisty little number that'll have you thinking lewd, rude and nude. It's a big claim, but as usual, we're able to deliver. It's an enormous thrill for Club Buggery to present uh, on the stool this evening, the old cruet sweller, that's vaudeville, and to supply the poke, Mick Microphone Conway! <laughs> Do what you will That's variety That's portable That's portable oh, With a little bit of corn And a little bit of tack That's portable oh, With a little bit of hope It's coming right back Shake a leg Shake a hand 
But go listen to that vocal band Who was crazy then It's crazy still That's variety And that's portable Come to that moment in the show where we celebrate your endeavour in the threads department here in the Torch of the Week on Club Buggery. Yes, once again, it's time for This Is Living. But before we go to this week's prizes, let's have a look at the deliriously happy couple who greeted the judge last Saturday night here in the Bug House. Roy! Yes, Garth, Christy and Laura and HG, we sent them off. There they were at Northright RSL. Uh, they were... They might have been a little bit underage, but we don't think so. This was the, this was the first time they'd ever played the pokies, the first time they'd uh, had, ever had a drink, and they went a little bit crazy, those kiddies, but they're totally addicted this now. This is living. So this is living. Yes, indeed. And this week's prize include the Fallen Angels hat, a magnificent hat there, the club buggery cards, as used by Mick Microphone Conway, and his CD, a mix CD with at least 18 tracks or so, and a special CD from Rebecca's Empire, plus Roy... Yes, I see. We're sending off uh, a very, very happy couple uh, to the Balmain Tigers Leagues Club. Oh, yes. And here it is. It's full of tradition, HG. You're met by the manager. Very, very nice white slacks. In you go. And it's all tradition. Tradition. Look at the old balls there, the old boots. There's uh, Dave Bolton's uh, 
jacket from 1969. Here's one that was worn in 1915 during the war. But it's old and new. It's a little bit modern, a little bit new. Here's a, a wonderful uh, trophy there. And here's the new bit. Uh, it's got all the facilities you would ever need and you make so many friends at Tigers Balmain Leagues Club. HG went with the uh, steak with a uh, mushroom sauce and baked vegetables and he said it was delicious because this is living. <laughs> This is living. This is living. Stuart and Kerry, is it? Yep, certainly yep. is. Ah, oh, congratulations. Look, you've come in black. It's a very traditional look. Are you happy with it? I was, thank you. Yes, did you dress him? Did you, was it your idea? Oh, God, no. No. <laughs> was it your idea? Yeah, a bit of both. Ah, oh, well, look, it's tremendous, you two young kids. Off you go. Can you take the challenge? Are you going to go to Tigers for us? I think we can. Because <laughs> this, this is living. Is living. <laughs> It's great as long as you don't get there too late. That's right, just don't get there too late. Yes, sadly, we come to, come to the end of another show. Roy, where are you off to in the coming few days? Uh, actually, uh, Liz Hayes and I are making up a, just a pairing for the uh, for tomorrow. We're going to see the monster trucks at Oran <laughs> at Oran Park. Yes. Uh, I know Liz loves the big trucks. Yes. Uh, I do too. It's going to be a sensational day. They're so big and powerful, oh, aren't yes, they? So, and they go so quick. They do. Uh, now uh, they get up to about sixty clicks. Look, there's a. I'll be going to a little bit of uh, Ian Terp's Terpy Magic tomorrow as part of the Bandstand family. Now, what connection Ian has with the Bandstand family, I'm lost. Uh, but he's packing down now with uh, Little Patty. Uh, Brian Davies and the rest of the gang. I think Brian Henderson is going to come over to introduce the acts. That's all at Para that Leeds. Great. It's a tremendous night of old, well, afternoon at least. They're, they're a bit old to be out at night. But uh, <laughs> it's a tremendous afternoon of old fashioned variety. And as we sign off from the torch, the Wick Roy and I'd like to thank John Quayle, Gary McDonald, Mick Conway, the Nissan Centre, the brand new Beatles, Ian Terps, Turpy, and you, the audience, whether here in Torch the Wick or there at home on the tool. Thanks for taking an interest in variety once again. Now, next week is the traditional Anzac Day Smoko uh, with a special guest list headed up by Jennifer Kite and Thelma Houston. Yes, the international flavour continues. Finally, it's time for Act 5 in the National Battle of the Sounds and remember, your votes will determine the 97 win winner. Uh, contestant number 5 is uh, presenting an old ACDC belt dropper and skirt lifter. <laughs> you shook me all night long. Australia, can you please give a humongous Battle of the Sounds blow-off welcome to Rebecca Barnard! See you next week, she was a fast machine She kept her motor clean She was the best damn woman That I ever seen Had those sagless eyes Telling me no lies Knocking me out With those American thighs Taking more than a share Had me fighting for air She told me to come But I was already there The walls were shaking the earth was quaking, my mind was aching, we were making it. Seduction loud She was one of the kind And she was mine all oh my I wanted no applause It's just another cause She made a meal out of me And then she come back for more Had to cool me down To take her another round Now I'm back in the ring To take another swing The walls were shaking The earth was quaking My mind was aching We were